The Tom Woods Show, episode 2284. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, creating an online course can be an excellent way of establishing yourself as an authority. It's also a great first product. And if you know what you're doing, it can generate you some real smackers. But how do you do it? Well, I have a teensy-weensy bit of experience with online courses, and I put together some material that takes you through step-by-step exactly what to do and then how to market that course so people find out about it and buy it. Get these free resources at tomwoods.com slash make courses. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. C.J. Kilmer is back with us again. You know C.J. as host of the Dangerous History Podcast. And speaking of dangerous, here's a ham-handed segue for you. C.J., in a way, took a real plunge not too long ago, if you'll remember from his previous appearance on this podcast. He left his academic job to throw himself entirely into his work with the Dangerous History Podcast. And he does a lot of really, really good material. And in fact, we're going to be kind of riffing on a very substantial ongoing series on Woodrow Wilson. I mean, more about Woodrow Wilson than you ever knew and parts of his life and career that may be obscure to you, CJ brings out. So first of all, CJ, congratulations to you that it all worked out. But not having that regular paycheck coming in, I get that there's certain anxiety about it. So I do want, at the end, I do want you to take a minute to make an appeal to my folks and you know maybe they can also support the work you're doing. Absolutely, Tom. And as always, it's great to talk to you. And thank you again to you for being very helpful. Of course, I used an Indiegogo campaign to launch myself, to give myself the kind of startup capital and takeoff velocity to walk away from the teaching job And you were very helpful to me having me on to talk about that. And I'm sure it was a big contributor to the success of that campaign. But yeah, I went fully rogue off the reservation after 22 years in academia, six as a student and 16 as a college history teacher. And yeah, it's been simultaneously very exciting and liberating and also terrifying because while my previous job didn't pay great. It paid predictably and steady. Yes. And, right. you know, it did have fairly decent benefits too. So, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's very liberating and I feel like I can, even more so than before, kind of take the gloves off and tell the truth as I see it, regardless of whose feathers it might ruffle. Well, let me add that I think some of the audience will know that a couple of times a year I have a house party. And I started this during COVID because I, along with you, live in a state where you were, in fact, allowed to socialize with people. How about that? And there was no arbitrary cap on that. And so I started that in the fall of 2020. And we had people coming, flying in from around the country, obviously not internationally, but around the country. And it was the first social engagement they'd had in six months, let's say. And I just decided I'm going to do this from now on. The only requirement to get an invitation to these parties is just to be a member in good standing of my supporting listeners program at supportinglisteners.com. And I want to point out that CJ will be among the guests. So there will be several guests whom I would consider, let's say, dignitaries, and CJ will be one of them. So that's April 29th. So if you join that little program, you'll get a little notification about it. All right, let's dig into our old friend Woodrow Wilson. Is it your opinion that Woodrow Wilson is the worst American president? Yes. As of right now, I would pick him as the worst. Although if our current president succeeds in his apparent desire to launch World War III, he could very easily surpass Wilson. But as of now, I would say as much damage as Biden and many of our recent presidents have done, I don't think any of them has yet quite done the kind of cumulative long-term damage that Wilson has. now. To be fair, you know, we've got over a century to look at the ripple effects of Wilson's legacy on not just the U.S., but the world. And so, you know what, I guess it's possible that somebody like me 100 years from now might look back and go, wow, you know, Joe Biden or George W. Bush or, you know, somebody like that. If you look at the long-term legacy of everything they did, maybe they're actually worse than Wilson. But yeah, as of right now, Wilson is my pick for worst of the worst. All right, but let's start with some material that I think maybe we're less likely to know about than the 
actual Wilson presidency. I think a lot of people know, just as a biographical note, that Wilson spent some time as president of Princeton University and then as governor of New Jersey. Is there anything in his tenure in either of those positions that would indicate for us, first of all, what his philosophy was, and secondly, what was to come as president of the U.S.? Yes, for sure. And for any of your listeners who are not familiar with my show and my work, I'm currently working on a multi-year project that I think I made the first episode of all the way back in 2019. And it is a super detailed deep dive into the life and career of Woodrow Wilson all the way from you know his childhood on up through his presidency and everything in between. And I just recently, by the way, put out part 10 of that series. And part 10 was, I believe, five and a half hours long. Oh my so, gosh, man. See what I mean, people? This is not a guy who's dishing out 10, 15-minute podcasts. He's putting enormous amounts of elbow grease into this to give you the whole story. All right, go ahead. Yeah, because lots of well-read libertarians, they know a lot of the reasons why Wilson was bad. But as I found when I started to really dig into him, there's so much more that even most well-read libertarians don't know as far as just terrible things about Wilson. So yeah, this has been a real labor of hate for me. And I, I've, <laughs> I've become kind of notorious as like the number one Wilson hater in our milieu. I've and, never heard that expression. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And people now routinely on Twitter and things send me all their best Wilson hating memes, you know, because they know I'm the guy for that. Yet the interesting thing about Wilson is that he's the only president we've ever had who's held a PhD degree. And he was in academia for, I believe, for approximately three decades before he ever ran for political office. So you can actually get a window into Wilson's political philosophy that you just cannot get on any other president we've ever had. You know, a few of the presidents we've had wrote some books and things before they were president, like Teddy Roosevelt wrote a fair amount of stuff. But Teddy Roosevelt, to my knowledge, never sat down and wrote like hundreds upon hundreds of pages on political philosophy and political science like Wilson did. So even before he was president of Princeton, when he was just a regular professor, he was writing books and articles and things. And when guys run for the presidency, they'll often put out these little ghost-written campaign biographies and manifestos and whatever like that. And of course, anybody who reads those thinking they're going to learn anything important or even true is probably crazy. But with Wilson, we've got this big body of work that he produced when he was an academic, when he wasn't even thinking about running for political office. And so unlike something that a professional politician puts out, if you look at Wilson's academic writings, it is reasonable, in my opinion, to presume that he's expressing his true beliefs because he was a tenured professor and then president of Princeton University, and he wasn't running for office. So presumably what he says in his academic work is what he really believed. And so you don't have to take it with a grain of salt the way you would, you know, someone's campaign ghostwritten book or whatever. So what do we learn about, for example, his view of the presidency? Do we learn something about that in his academic work? Yeah, he actually kind of shifted on that. When he first started as an academic, he believed that the Congress was the key to reforming the government in the ways that he would like, which, you know, later come to be known as progressive. And so, you know, he's probably influenced by just the general Gilded Age era, 1870s, 1880s, when the Congress was generally kind of more powerful and had more of the initiative and the presidency, you know, was occupied by relatively restrained presidents for the most part. And so I think because of that, Wilson initially was like, oh yeah, the Congress is the key. And he had these ideas to basically reform the Congress to make it more like the English parliament. So there'd be fewer checks and balances and things like that. But then over time, by the later 19th century, he seems to have shifted and decided that the presidency was the key and should be like more equal than the other branches of government. There's a somewhat notorious quote by him where he says something like, you know, the president is the only national voice in affairs and let him win the you know, belief of the people and no one can stand in his way. Something like that that almost sounds a bit proto-fascistic. But that was later on in his career. So I did a huge multi-hour episode a couple of years ago where I just went through 
his academic writings and you know put together a big long presentation about the high points and low points and whatever because even a lot of Wilson biographers don't seem to have looked at his academic writings very much and so there's a lot there that's very interesting you know there's a school of thought amongst libertarians who know that Wilson's a bad guy and they want to pin all the blame on Edward Mandel House and I think House deserves some blame for some things and I'm certainly someone who thinks House is a villain but if you go back and read Wilson's academic writing, and, and these people, by the way, who want to blame everything ultimately on House and the powerful Anglo-American elites House represented, they basically act like Wilson was an empty suit, you know, was a blank slate as far as his ideas. And then House just came in and told him what to do when he started running for president. But the reality is, if you look at Wilson's academic writings, he already believed all the sorts of things that House did as well, that House wrote about in that book, Philip Drew Administrator. So it wasn't that House discovered a blank slate named Woodrow Wilson and then told him what to you know, push for politically. It was more like House found a guy who already believed 90% of the same things House did. And so he goes, all right, this guy will be a good guy to work with. Right, right, right. And, but not to mention, what is the likelihood that the president of Princeton University, who's done academic writing on American government and then governor of a U.S. state, is actually a blank slate? You know, yeah. Not plausible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there's also kind of a more academic establishment view of Wilson that he wasn't really much of a progressive, that he was like a, you know, Southern conservative or whatever. Ugh. And my take on that idea that Wilson was actually like some, you know, traditional Southern Jeffersonian is that if you look at most of his academic work, he does not at all sound like that. He sounds, if anything, like a hardcore Hamiltonian and Lincolnian on most issues. Yeah. And my take is that when he started to think towards the latter part of his academic career, when he started to think about maybe running for political office, he was savvy enough to know that a lot of his progressive ideas, a lot of which is really based on continental European statism, like Hegelianism and things like this, Wilson knew that a lot of those ideas were directly contrary to sort of most traditional American political science. And so my take is that what he did was he figured out a way to express these very kind of Eurostatist ideas in language that sounds Jeffersonian. And so in some of my episodes, I've covered some of his speeches where there was a speech he gave, and I'm blanking on the exact venue, but it was pretty soon before he launched his political career, he was invited by some prominent Democrats to speak at like the Thomas Jefferson Day dinner or whatever that they do. And he basically went in there and basically argued that like Thomas Jefferson's ideas were no longer relevant to America. Because of course, as a progressive, he believes there are no like eternal truths or principles or anything like that. And so, you know, he sort of praises Jefferson, but then quickly pivots to, but Jefferson was a man of his time. And so the specifics of his ideas are not really appropriate to our era because he believed very much that there's what he sometimes called the spirit of the age and that, you know, ideas, political principles, institutions, whatever, they should never be timeless and fixed, but always changing and evolving with the spirit of the age. And of course, who knows what the spirit of the age is? Well, the answer is enlightened, progressive intellectuals and politicians like Woodrow Wilson. So basically, my argument is he melded his progressive principles, or he camouflaged them, maybe is a better way to put it, with Jeffersonian sounding language. Because it was very much a transitional phase for the Democratic Party at the turn of the century. I mean, you still had Grover Cleveland type Democrats around, but then you also had populists and also progressives. And so if Wilson wanted to be a successful National Democratic Party figure, he needed to figure out a way to kind of, to some degree, tell all three of those factions what they wanted to hear or to couch it in a way that they could all kind of Rorschach what they wanted to hear onto it. So a Grover Cleveland Democrat might hear his speech and, you know, interpret it one way and go, oh, this is, you know, an old school regular Democrat like we're used to. But a populist or a progressive would then hear what they wanted to hear. You know, I remember reading about Woodrow Wilson as a high school student in, you know, the high school textbook. 
in fact, I remember when I used to have to teach this in college and they made me use a textbook. Oh, textbooks are just the worst anyway. They're, they're boring. They're always 50 years out of date on the most recent scholarly work. They're just awful. But I remember the way the 1912 election was portrayed. You know, it was portrayed as, you know, a wild, like a crazy conflict between two wildly different people. I mean, I'm thinking about the two who really are significant here in in American life in the early 20th century. I'm talking about the alleged massive differences between Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt. Now, we're told that these were just massive. They were so different. And Teddy was way different from uh, Wilson. But this alleged massive difference between them is the kind of massive difference these same people pretend to see between Mitt Romney, (laughs) you know, and whoever the, you know, Joe Lieberman or something. (laughs) I'm sorry, I don't see the really big difference. So with Wilson and and TR, yeah, maybe they would, their foreign interventions would occur for different reasons, but they would still have them. Or maybe one of them wants to regulate big business one way and the other wants to regulate it some different way. Okay, that's the huge, massive difference between them. I don't buy this. I mean, what do you think? Am I wrong? Am I oversimplifying things? No, I would agree with that, that the clash between Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt, it was primarily rhetoric and kind of personality and style. So, you know, Teddy Roosevelt has this macho persona and this kind of bombastic style, and especially on foreign policy, he's got very belligerent rhetoric. And then you've got Woodrow Wilson, former college professor, and, you know, sort of nerdy and all that sort of stuff, does not have this, you know, reputation as a cowboy and a hunter and a soldier in the Spanish-American War. And, you know, a lot of Teddy Roosevelt's persona was more fictional than real, but that's, you know, at least some of it was based on real stuff. And so, yeah, you had this very contrasting personal and rhetorical style. And as you were saying, there were slight differences on the exact details of how they thought that the progressive corporate state should operate. You know, they did disagree on exactly what the relationship should be between the state and corporations and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, I would agree with you that from any perspective that's not looking at it from within the progressive paradigm, the differences are minuscule. So I think a big part of the reason, though, why it's usually interpreted that way, especially in things like textbooks, is for the simple reason that the overwhelming majority of academic historians, since at least about the 1890s, have been themselves progressives. And so if you're a progressive, whether you're a, like a 1930s progressive writing about the 1912 election, or you're a 1960s progressive, or you're a more recent progressive, regardless, you're coming from 95% chance, you're coming from a progressive perspective looking at this election. And so it's one of those like tyranny of small differences kind of things, you know, in the same way that like two different camps of Marxists will bitterly disagree with each other almost more than they would disagree with someone of a totally different ideology or the way that, you know, two factions, two different, you know, like Sunni and Shia Islam will fight bitterly. And yet to an outsider of a completely different religion, they're looking at it going, what are you guys even really arguing about? So that's how I would see it. There's so many things obviously we'd say about Woodrow Wilson. I mean, we could... Oh, we could get into World War I, we could get into the domestic side of things. But I want to just make sure and clarify something, because every once in a while, sort of in libertarian circles, but often more in, let's say, Alex Jones-style circles. Now, not Alex Jones himself, but sometimes some of his followers. You'll see people trying to say that Woodrow Wilson regretted creating the Federal Reserve. And they quote him as saying that, he has done something awful to his country and indicating his regret. But this is a fake quotation. He was proud of creating the Federal Reserve. I think the reason people go for this is that there are some of us who don't want to have to face the reality, which is that we're alone here. There is no crusading president who was trying to swoop in and rescue us, but he was unfortunately put upon by the bad guys. I'd like to believe that. That's a much more comfortable thing to believe than to believe that they're all in on it. But unfortunately, I think that's rather the case. Yeah, that quote that's 
repeated in some conspiratorial circles. If I remember right, I think it's kind of a mishmash of something he did actually say, but in a completely yes. different context. Right. And then something either from like years later or that was even fabricated and then put together in a way to give a very misleading impression. So, yeah, I have read a gigantic pile of documents about Wilson, biographies, secondary literature about related topics like World War I and the Progressive Era. And I've also read piles of primary sources related to all this. And I have never come across the slightest shred of verifiable evidence that Woodrow Wilson ever regretted in any way being the president who signed the Federal Reserve into law. And it sort of reminds me of the way that a lot of those same people will also claim that John F. Kennedy was intending to get rid of the Fed, and that's the real reason that he was assassinated. But you know, if you actually look into it, you find out, no, there's no evidence at all that he ever gave the slightest thought to getting rid of the Fed. And the whole thing about, oh, he was issuing silver certificates. Yeah, that was still a thing at the time. But if I remember right, I think he was actually, uh, Kennedy was closing that down. He was sort of like signing into law or whatever the regulations that would end silver certificates. Yeah, G. Edward Griffin, and a lot of people who say they've read G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, also believe in this myth that JFK was assassinated because he was trying to end the Fed or something. And then they didn't read very closely because G. Edward Griffin doesn't really go for that. I was also wondering, I could have sworn I had seen a biography of him, but now I can't find it. Are you aware of a biography of Edward House, Edward Mandel House? We call him Colonel House. That was just an honorary title. He was kind of, as you mentioned, Wilson's alter ego, this shadowy figure in the White House. Is there a biography? I mean, his papers, I think, are available. Yeah, there's one that I read years ago. I actually did an episode very early on in my podcast many years ago about Colonel House. And I'm trying to remember. It's hard to find. If it exists, it's hard to find. You type in his name and biography and you just don't get anything. I mean, I know there has to be one somewhere, but I remember if there is one, it was written in the past 25 years. Because I remember talking to Murray Rothbard himself, and he said to me, it is very odd that we have this man who, behind the scenes, as you say, he didn't necessarily plant the ideas in Wilson's head, but he was a very significant figure in a mover and a shaker, and we haven't got any biography of this guy? Yeah, there was one that I read all those years ago. I don't think I still have it. I might have even gotten it from a library or something, but I want to say the title was something along the lines of Woodrow Wilson's... Right hand or something? I'm looking at it right now, but it took a while to find it. Colonel House, a biography of Woodrow Wilson's silent partner. Hmm. There we go. I don't know if that, maybe that wasn't the one. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. No, I'm not so sure. But it's just odd. I mean, like there's almost nothing on this guy. (laughs) I mean, that is very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I will say about Colonel House is, first off, he is an archetype example of a figure that you find in most presidential administrations, and some presidential administrations will have more than one guy who sort of fits this type. And he's what I would refer to as a man behind the curtain. And these are individuals who usually they have no official title within the administration, but they're extremely close to the president. And they serve the function of being sort of like go-betweens between the president and the corporate you know, string pullers who are really calling the shots. And so Teddy Roosevelt had one of these, a guy named George W. Perkins, who was literally a business partner of J.P. Morgan and one of T.R.'s closest advisors as president. And so, you know, during Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, J.P. Morgan was super notorious, mostly in a negative way in the United States. And so if J.P. Morgan himself is frequently meeting with the president and advising him, Everybody in the press and everywhere else is going to know about it. But, you know, an obscure business partner of his that the public really doesn't know can come and go. And House basically performed a similar function for Wilson. He was plugged in to not just the American, but the British kind of power elite, financial elites, that sort of thing. And so he performed that man behind the curtain function. And based on my research, where House probably had the most influence, because Like I was saying, Wilson already believed 
you know, all these progressive ideas that House did before the two of them ever met. But where I think House changed Wilson the most was in regard to World War I. Because I think House was probably the most important figure in gradually pulling Wilson around to the idea that the U.S. should get into World War I. So that'll be probably my next regular Woodrow Wilson episode that I'm going to make is going to be all about the time span from the outbreak of World War I in the summer of 1914 until Wilson got the country in the war officially in the spring of 1917. And so covering like how much the U.S. was not really neutral during that time period and how much things were being manipulated to bring the U.S. into intervening. And again, based on all my research, my belief is that when the war initially broke out in Europe and Wilson initially started making proclamations of neutrality and saying the U.S. wouldn't get involved, I believe he was sincere initially in that belief and that desire. I think somewhere along the way, he continued to say those things publicly, but he no longer believed them and he was essentially lying to the public. You know, clearly by his re-election campaign, he kept us out of war. He had already made the decision that he was going to get the country into war probably after getting re-elected. And so I think it was probably somewhere between the outbreak of the war and the aftermath of the Lusitania, somewhere in there, he made the decision in his mind that he was eventually going to get the U.S. into the war when it was politically opportune. And I think Warehouse probably deserves more blame is there. Because I think House, whose you know, father was an English immigrant to the United States, who became like the richest guy in Texas or something. And House continued to have close connections with the British elite. I mean, House was a guy who, when he would vacation in England, he'd be like having lunches with dukes and, you know, could even get the occasional meeting with the king. I mean, you know, was buddies with a lot of the British, you know, city of London financial elites. So I think House, as sort of like the Jafar figure whispering into Wilson's ear, that where he had the most on actually changing Wilson on something was in regard to getting the country into war. Because I think there's a fair amount of evidence that House, for sure, was wanting to get the U.S. into the war well before it actually happened in 1917. Domestically, it seems like the key thing for Wilson is the creation of the Federal Reserve. The income tax thing was already coming into effect before him. So that's also a significant thing. But, you know, then there's like the Clayton Antitrust Act, which, you know, adds some extra teeth to the Sherman Antitrust Act. But I mean, really, other than these major things, you know, there are some progressive reforms here and there. But it's got to be the case that overwhelmingly World War I just dominates the way we look at Woodrow Wilson. Yes, the Fed is significant. Probably any progressive president was going to do that. But am I, is there any major domestic initiative that I'm overlooking in assessing this? Because it seems like all of them are swamped by the significance of the entry into World War I. Yeah, well, basically what happened with Wilson, you know, obviously World War I became like a huge distraction for obvious reasons from domestic politics. But also the way he operated when he was governor of New Jersey for two years is he came into office very quickly, pushed and, you know, was skillful in getting past a laundry list of progressive reforms for the state of New Jersey. And then after this initial burst of legislation, he kind of went dormant almost. and. That kind of happened with his presidency as well on the domestic front. He pushes, most of his major domestic legislation was pushed within the first year or two of his presidency. And so, yeah, World War I is a big distraction. Other foreign policy things too, by the way, were distracting his administration, not just World War I. And this is a subject that I'm actually working on a bonus episode, and it'll be a big, you know, multi-hour one, by the way for the people who support me on places like Patreon and Subscribestar. And I'm going to call it Woodrow Wilson's Banana Wars. And it's going to be all about... Ooh. Yeah, yeah. The often overlooked hyper-interventionism of Woodrow Wilson in Latin America and the Caribbean. That tends to get overshadowed by World War I. But, you know, he was a trigger-happy liberal internationalist interventionist. He was like the original Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, where, you know, if you compare his rhetoric to TR's rhetoric, TR sounds like John McCain. TR's a loudmouth warmonger and not trying to hide it. Whereas Wilson's rhetoric sounds a lot more like someone like Obama, where his rhetoric sounds 
very dovish and you know very restrained on foreign policy and very idealistic. But then you look at his actions rather than his words, and he's a trigger happy interventionist. So Wilson actually invaded Mexico twice, and most people know about who are knowledgeable about the era and about Wilson. They know about the intervention to go after Pancho Villa, but there was actually an earlier smaller one in, I think it was Veracruz, a smaller one just involving some Navy sailors and some Marines. And that was just about some little stupid local incident that happened and Wilson decided to occupy the city. He also invaded and occupied Haiti, and that was an occupation that would last until the 1930s. And there were a whole number of other of these, you know, small war, banana war type conflicts, you know, the sorts of things that Smedley Butler was being sent into in a lot of cases. And so I'm going to be covering that. That's, like I said, something that often gets overshadowed, but I think it is very important and illustrative that, you know, if you think liberal interventionism started with the Clintons or Obama or something like that, no, it is as old as progressivism. You know, this very week, I just interviewed Ryan Walters who has released a biography of Warren Harding. And obviously, you know, there's a little connection between Warren Harding and Woodrow Wilson because Harding was viewed as pretty much as overwhelming a repudiation of Woodrow Wilson as it was possible to come up with. The guy is not exactly the president of Princeton University. On the other hand, he wasn't a dope. People portray him falsely in that regard. But he had no wild utopian schemes. He wasn't going to, introduce an international organization that he thought would enforce peace everywhere. He just wanted Americans to live regular lives again. And the failure of Wilson is evident there, that if after years of this and after years of urging Americans on to what he considered to be great things, if he couldn't keep them on that path, then he failed. He failed to bring them on board. And when he was talking about the League of Nations and stuff, he was extremely contemptuous of his opponents, of the pretty much the entire Republican Party, and he paid the price for it. I don't know if he thought just through his force of sheer will he could get what he wanted, but somehow he had failed to get the American public to think this was something worth doing. And so he winds up after 1920 seeing the White House, well, I mean, of course, he was in terrible health, but seeing the White House taken over by a guy who had very few international ambitions. Yeah, Warren Harding is one of my favorite presidents for sure, you know, or least terrible presidents or something like that. And yeah, it's partly because he very much was like the anti Wilson. I mean, if you just think about his famous campaign slogan, right, a return to normalcy. Well, what's he yeah. really saying with that slogan? He's basically signaling to the voters, I am not a progressive. We have had nothing but progressive presidents basically since Teddy Roosevelt was there. I mean, I guess you could right. argue Taft was like progressive light, but whatever. But he's basically coding like, hey, are you tired of all these constant reforms and things and moral crusades and World War One and you know all these things? And of course, the implication is that that's abnormal. Yeah. And if you're tired of being abnormal, I'm just the guy. Yeah, yeah. And my recollection is that Harding was elected in a pretty significant landslide in 1920, which, you know. Yes, yes, indeed. The popular vote and the electoral vote, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a big part of it is, all the stuff that went along with World War I because the U.S. was only in the war officially for less than two years. And, you know, overall, the American body count in that war wasn't gigantic. It was a very small fraction of the Civil War's body count and, you know, not even anywhere near as much as the American body count in World War II would be. But it's a part of it that, again, I think sometimes gets overlooked that I plan to delve into a lot on my podcast is that the Wilson administration went authoritarian at home very hard and very fast in a way that's never quite been replicated. Even in World War II, there was a bit more restraint on like suppression of domestic civil liberties. And so the U.S. is in the war for less than two years, and yet there's draconian censorship, there is massive amounts of state propaganda, and Famously, there's military conscription, and then there's also other suppressions of civil liberties to try to back that up, such as the infamous Espionage and Sedition Acts, which criminalized free speech. And thousands of Americans, some famous people and some not, did federal prison time just for giving a speech. 
And incidentally, as long as we've brought up Warren Harding, it was Harding who let Eugene V. Debs go. Right. Not Wilson. Wilson absolutely, resolutely refused. Every time it was put on his desk, he would deny it. And he wanted Debs to just rot in prison, from which he ran for president unsuccessfully, we might add. But it was Warren Harding who very simply said, basically, these people never meant any harm. And he said, I wanted him to have his Christmas dinner with his wife. The way a normal human being who doesn't politicize all of life thinks. Yeah, and that's even despite the fact that Debs was the most famous socialist in America and Harding was very much not a socialist, but like you said, he was a decent human being. And yeah, and by the way, in that speech, it's a very interesting speech to read, the one that Eugene Debs got arrested for. Oh, in trouble for? for? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Eugene Debs is my favorite socialist in American history just because he was such a boss on the war issue. But he knew that he was being surveilled by government agents and they were basically just looking for him to step wrong so that they could lock him up. And yet he went and gave that speech, I think it was in Dayton, Ohio. He basically knew when he walked in to give that speech, he's like, they're going to arrest me, but I'm going to say what I want to say anyway. So I, I have huge respect for him for that. And in that speech, he said things like, American boys need to know that they are fit for something better than slavery and cannon fodder. Now think about Woodrow Wilson locks a man in federal prison, a peaceful political activist and an old man, locks him in federal prison for telling American young men that they're fit for something better than slavery and cannon fodder. That is speech that is not protected under the First Amendment, according to Wilson. So yeah, that really shows you the caliber. And there's, there's all the, oh, I'm trying to remember this, is it Shank v. United States, the famous case where the Supreme oh, Court basically said- Shouting fire in a crowded theater, that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where basically they argue that handing out flyers and things like that against the government's policies is tantamount to virtually waging war on the United States. And, you know, basically rubber stamping the idea that the First Amendment doesn't apply during an emergency. Yeah. And of course, the logic behind all that is all wrong. You know, as Rothbard pointed out, and other people have pointed out, the issue of shouting fire in a crowded theater just boils down to property rights. If you shout fire in a crowded theater and it's, there's no fire, then you're disrupting a performance and therefore you're violating the rules on somebody's property. We don't need any special exception to the rule of free speech to cover shouting fire in a crowded theater. Property law already covers that. You know, these are the rules my theater, my rules. So we don't need to have these various exceptions. Did you happen, this is a little bit of a tangent, but did you happen to hear that Roger Waters of Pink Floyd spoke at an address to the uh, UN Security Council the other day? No, no. I think the last thing I saw about him was that one of his former bandmates was criticizing him for criticizing NATO's oh, yeah. policies. But Yeah, of course. Yeah, David Gilmore is just hopeless. And Waters has his own problems, personality problems, I'll grant you. But he's dead right on this. And even though, yeah, he's on the left, but he's on the hard enough left that he doesn't get taken in by Joe Biden rhetoric, you know, and, and I can respect that. And somehow he was able to deliver remotely an address to the UN Security Council. It's on YouTube. And it recalls the language and the idioms and just the way of speaking that we see in the Eugene Debs speech. He said exactly what you just said. Basically, the way he put it was, we are the voiceless majority. And we do not want to be cannon fodder for your wars. It's not exactly the speech I would have given, but it's much better than anything else you're hearing in that UN Security Council these days. So, of course, everybody immediately attacked him. Doesn't he know we have these 12 talking points from the Pentagon? Hasn't he read them? That, that kind of thing. But it was fantastic. And it really, really did kind of revive the old spirit of Eugene Debs. And I can respect, as you say, I can respect a Eugene Debs because when push comes to shove, when the chips are really down on a policy that really matters and affects all of us and can impoverish and devastate nations and civilizations, you know, if he's going to be good on that, I can overlook the other things temporarily. You know, if he's going to be good on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in my own mind, I always sort of like triage what are really the most vital issues in a given time. And I would say that during World War I, if you're an American, opposing the war, opposing conscription, opposing the suppression of civil liberties, those are the more, most important things at the moment. And so I might disagree vehemently with Eugene Debs on what we ought to do with the railroads or something like that. 
But yeah, I mean, in the context of like, we can argue about the railroads some other time. First, let's make sure that the railroads aren't all blown up. Yeah, you let's know, make sure let's make exist. sure we still have the railroads. Yeah, I very much agree with our mutual friend Scott Horton that avoiding nuclear annihilation should be first, second, third, fourth, fifth most important thing on everybody's list if people were actually sane and thinking rationally and not so heavily propagandized. I mean, that shouldn't even be something that you have to think very hard about. That everything else is on the back burner compared to the possibility of nuclear World War III. Where do people find, obviously they go to a podcast app and type in Dangerous History Podcast, but where else would you like to direct people who might be interested in following? Sure. Well, if you just want to go to the homepage of my website, you can just put in DangerousHistoryPodcast.com and look at my back catalog there. Also, I want to mention that people can support me. Currently, I'm on Patreon and Subscribestar, potentially some other venues down the road I might be on, but that's what I'm on right now. And they can sign up to support me there and get a big variety of perks depending on how much they contribute. Bonus episodes that aren't available to the public, like my upcoming Banana War, Wilson Banana Wars episode. Um, also, if they contribute a little bit more, they can access things like uh, monthly live streams with me. And also, I do a monthly book club over Zoom if someone wants to chip in enough to get access to that. So yeah, I would very much appreciate the support there. I could definitely use all the help I can get because as Tom was saying at the beginning of the episode, I am off the reservation. And one final thing I'll mention is I finally got around to doing something I should have done a long, long time ago, but better late than never. I finally started setting up a proper email list thanks to the inspiration and information from Tom. And okay. so anybody listening, you can go to Dangerous bib.com dangerous bib.com and if you sign up with your email there to get emails from me as a thank you you will get my dangerous american history bibliography which oh yeah it's a list of over 150 books recommended by me about various aspects of american history organized by kind of topic area and with comments and annotations by me and there you go. You get that for free just by signing up for my email list. Wow. Now that's a lot of work, but good for you. That is a really valuable thing. And that's therefore what makes it perfect as a lead magnet for your list. So I'll have dangerousbib.com, also dangerousHistoryPodcast.com, have and your Twitter. I'll have it all up there at tomwoods.com slash 2284. Well, thanks so much, CJ. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Tom. All right, folks, we're going to balance off the evil of Woodrow Wilson with something, well, a little bit more uplifting and positive for your life. And that is a brand new podcast by a couple of my listeners, and it's called Wiznugs, W-I-Z-N-U-G-S. The idea is that you will find in there nuggets of wisdom. And the wisdom they're talking about is the kind you acquire both through books and through life experience. So when you head to mywiznugs.com, which is the website, the central hub of the podcast, and then click to see their whole collection of videos, you'll see the topics are things like how to make your spouse happy, how to achieve your goals, how to change your life if that's something you want to do, or hope for thriving through depression, or struggling with feeling abandoned, here's the help you need. But really all kinds of valuable advice, and you're just going to love the two guys who host it. So check it out, mywiznugs.com. That's M-Y-W-I-Z-N-U-G-S.com. I'll link to it on the show notes page. And remember, I can help you if you're going to start a website. I'll make sure you get some traffic and some free tutorials and membership in my private group to get help when you need it. All these things come to you for not one extra cent. They are free bonuses for me, but you got to claim them before you start that site. You'll get the details when you check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, Wilfred Riley joins us. We're going to talk about the police and white privilege and all kinds of fun, completely uncontroversial material. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.